Hello, my name's Paul Redding. I'm Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at the University of Sydney, and I want to tell you something about my new book on the philosopher Hegel. The book's called Conceptual Harmonies, The Origins and Relevance of Hegel's Logic, as published by University of Chicago Press. In it, I break with the common assumption that Hegel's logic had little or nothing to do with logic as it's currently understood, and especially little or nothing to do with mathematics, a discipline that plays a crucial role in modern scientific logic. But as you might gather from the title, the mathematics with which I'm concerned, at least in the first instance, is not so much mathematics as generally familiar today, but as it was conceived in ancient Greece, when mathematics had been closely linked to the theory of musical harmony. This aspect of Hegel's work was especially expressed by his support for the astronomical theories of Johannes Kepler, theories he thought more realistic than the approach found in Isaac Newton. Kepler had made major astronomical discoveries, but he had also appealed to the way Plato had invoked musical theory in his early account of the cosmos in the dialogue Timaeus. In supporting this idea, Hegel was generally laughed at by scientists of his time, and perhaps Hegelians have been a bit embarrassed by this odd term taken by his work. Certainly on first encounter, it seems more mythical and mystical than rational or scientific. Apparently tied to the idea of the planets emitting harmonious heavenly sounds as they travel around the sun. I argue, however, that there's nothing to be embarrassed about concerning the direction of Hegel's thinking here. The harmonies invoked were relevant at the conceptual, not celestial level, in that Hegel modelled his account of conceptual relations on the relations among various numerical magnitudes that were found to underlie Greek music theory. The book traces the way Greek thinkers, and especially Plato and his followers, had reacted to a pressing mathematical problem that had arisen around their time, a problem concerned with the relations between the existing two branches of mathematics, arithmetic and geometry. On the basis of the commonsensical conception of number, to which the Greeks adhered, it had been discovered that relations between continuous geometric magnitudes, such as lines, areas, volumes, and so on, could not all be expressed by ratios of numbers. These two types of magnitudes, continuous and discrete, were held to be incommensurable, and this posed a problem for the application of mathematics to the world in sciences like astronomy. The problem would be apparently solved in early modern Europe with a new conception of what it was to be a number. This was the so-called real numbers, in which everyday natural numbers, one, two, three, four, and so on, and ratios of such numbers as used by the Greeks, were now joined by what seemed to many to be impossible numbers. These were numbers such as negative numbers, magnitudes, as it was said, supposedly less than nothing, and especially irrational numbers, numbers proposed as solving the problems of assigning numbers to incommensurable geometric ratios. The trouble was that an irrational number can only be specified by an infinite decimal fraction, and so can actually, actually never be written down. The person who coined the term in the 16th century, Michael Stiefel, described them as fleeing perpetually and hidden under a cloud of infinity. Not able to be grasped precisely, such a number was, he claimed, not a number at all. Nevertheless, these numbers would prove essential for the new sciences and would be widely used within physics. However, they wouldn't be defined within mathematics until about half a century after Hegel's death. And even now, some mathematicians worry over their supposed reality. Hegel was not convinced by this modern solution to the problem of incommensurability, 
an appeal to the way that Plato and some of his followers had tried to resolve the incommensurability between geometric and arithmetic ratios differently. Here they had appealed to a peculiar set of relations holding among three proportions basic to the music theory of the Pythagoreans, in particular the so-called musical tetractus, a complex double ratio among numbers. They chose for simplicity the numbers 6, 8, 9 and 12. In fact, these proportions would reappear in the 17th century in a new type of geometry called projective geometry, which examined relations with, among projections from different points of view within three-dimensional space. While projective geometry didn't catch on at first, it was re-emerging around Hegel's own time. Hegel certainly knew about it. And it would come to play an important role in the mathematics of the 19th century. It would become bound up, for example, with another new form of geometry called linear algebra, in which algebraic operations were extended from numbers to directed lines, or so-called vectors. Linear algebra would become important for natural sciences like physics and is a staple of university level mathematics today. These are the sorts of directions in mathematics, both ancient and modern, that I argue helped shape Hegel's logic, and they illuminate many of the puzzling features of his proposed science of logic. When logical studies re emerged around the middle of the 19th century, logicians like George Boole and Augustus de Morgan, and later, especially, Charles Sanders Peirce, would be particularly influenced by this new algebraic thinking. But they would thus create a different type of logic to that which would become most influential in analytic philosophy, the so-called classical logic of Gottlob Frege and Bertrand Russell. While classical logic looked to analysis, an area of mathematics tightly bound to the system of real numbers, the followers of Boole and de Morgan looked to the operations of algebra as basic, extending them beyond numbers to other sorts of things, not only lines, but propositions. Quite a few logicians working within this alternate non-classical form of logic have thought of it as having distinctly Hegelian features. The role played in Hegel's thought by the Platonists' appeal to the mathematics of music, I believe, helps to show why this is so.